summary. <laughs> okay. And I think all right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Trollywell Logic for the 29th of August, 2015. And we're here, 7 p.m. here, UK time, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time over stateside. Uh, just to let everyone know, you can call in any uh, in the show later on. The Skype contact, as you see, is the bottom of your screen is Trollywell Logic. So just add us on Skype. I'll send a few PMs just to check what the topic of your question is, and we'll add you in due course. Just please do not call us. It just distract us during the interview or the show. And so we'll just quickly introduce the panel tonight and welcome you back. Pumpkin, what's happening? Uh, not much. Home from work, looking forward to going out and getting drunk. But in the meantime, I'll settle for this. <laughs> and uh, uh, welcome you back, Marty. How's it going? Yeah, I'm doing fine. And uh, Zilla, what's up? Oh, good, oh, good. Okay, everyone. Um, Kitch was meant to be here, and he did have a nice introduction written for our guest. So I am just going to have to come up with, hopefully, something workable on the fly. Uh, welcoming to the show is a well-known biotechnologist. He was one of the involved in understanding expressions of BT genes within cotton, and I can't remember your exact role, but I'll say that you do work within Monsanto. So everyone, please welcome to the show, Dr. Fred Perlack. Thank you very much for having me, Cal. It's oh, a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's great to have you. And so I think we'll just get on with a few basic questions just to get your background and all that. So what got you interested in biotech? Well, I, um, I uh, was, I had a, um, bachelor's degree in science from Fairfield University in Connecticut. And I did a senior project working in uh, microbiology as a um, senior project. And I found that I really enjoyed working in the laboratory more than anything else that I could do. Went to graduate school, worked on Bacillus thuringiensis and its genetics as a graduate student. Uh, found I had an aptitude for doing research. It was easy for me. Uh, time went by very quickly and from there I did a postdoc at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio and then from there to Monsanto. When I started at Monsanto in 1981 my job was basically to identify how we could take advances in recombinant DNA, genetic engineering and apply them to improve agriculture. And so the obvious choice was to move BT genes both into other bacteria that colonize plants and eventually put BT genes into plants. Okay. I and, for, and for those of us who are not uh, sciencing regarding squishy stuff, what's a BT gene? Um, BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a microorganism found in the soil. It has the unusual characteristic of producing a, a protein uh, as a distinct crystal inside, inside the cell. That particular protein has very uh, high toxicity to a certain class of damaging insect pests, the Lepidopteran insects. Those are the insects that are the larval forms of certain moths that are particularly devastating to crops. Uh, corn earworm, tomato fruit worm, cotton bowl worm. If you see a worm on a tomato or ear of corn or um, even on vegetable crops like lettuce or cabbage, uh, it's probably that group of insects. And, and Bacillus thuringiensis, the protein produced, is extremely active. In fact, um, for years in the 50s and 60s, uh, um, farmers have been um, can utilize microbial preparations of Bacillus thuringiensis sprayed over their fields to protect them from damage by insects. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So Zilla or Pumpkin, do you have anything to come in with right now? Um, one little question is, I've always been curious about um, insect repellent uh, GMOs and the same could be said of pesticides, but I've always been curious. Uh, the fact that 
insects can't really eat them, does that expect or does that cause any kind of damage to the food chain with, you know, less food for something one step above insects not being able to get it and causing a knock on effect? Does that ever become an issue or that's a that's a real good question, Pumpkin. It, it, I have to tell you, it's very difficult for me to call you Pumpkin, <laughs> but that's another story. Call me angry. Everyone does. Okay, angry. That's good. <laughs> um, because one of the things we have to assess when we look at plants um, that are genetically engineered is what effect will they have on the environment? How will they affect things that happen? Um, in the case of uh, Bt plants, the insects that are eating the plants are described as pests already. There's nothing natural about the fact that you have a large number of acreage of those particular plants and the insects get to very, very high, unusually inflated numbers because it's such a fertile area for them for having food that they can use. So it really isn't as disruptive as you might think. There is a ecological balance that you find in a field uh, that can get changed or established. So for example, um, in, the, in the United States and Arizona, they had problems with an insect called the pink bollworm, and they also had problems with white flies. The way it worked was they would spray over and over with pyrethroids to try to control the pink bollworm. As a consequence, they were killing the white flies, but eventually the white flies were becoming resistant. And every time you sprayed with pyrethroids, more and more resistant white flies would show up. As a consequence of using all those insecticides, you actually caused a bloom of the secondary pests because you were killing all the predators of the white flies more efficiently than you were killing the white flies. Once BT cotton was introduced, we controlled the pink bollworm. When the pink bollworm was controlled, they no longer sprayed the pyrethroids. When they no longer sprayed the pyrethroids, the natural predators took over and controlled the white flies to a manageable level in the field. So by eliminating um, one of the biggest problems and having to spray constantly for it, you actually got a halo effect where other pests were more, more efficiently controlled by natural mechanisms. So it's almost sort of like a chicken and egg situation. It is. Yeah, there's so and, many insects because there's so many crops and Well, and and if you're a farmer, there are there are certain treatments that you make. So on a big field, for example, a farmer might spray a pyrethroid, but he'll know he'll have to go back and spray 21, 28 days later for another pest that'll bloom as a consequence of that spray. The advantage of things like BT, uh, BT cotton is an example, is if it's skillfully used to integrate into a program, a farmer can then maximize the use of intellectual, uh, not, uh, of beneficial insects in an integrated pest management system. It's a tool. Biotech is a tool, and if properly used, is very, very effective. But just because you can cut lumber doesn't mean you can build a house. You have to pay attention. You have to work at it. And if you're good farmers, do well with these kinds of situations. So it's, if I'm understanding it right, it's basically using a BT. Is it BT resistant or BT infused? It's BT infused. We actually produce the protein that used to be produced or still produced in the in the bacteria but we take that gene out and we put it specifically into the plant so it produces it throughout the plant right. so that when the insect shows up it's as if you had sprayed it with bt right when it gets there so it's by using the bt infused plants it's reducing pesticides so it's sort of a more efficient method of pest control rather than uh, try to solve one having to solve another. So it's that's cor that's correct. It, the the pesticides that traditionally are used, the organophosphates, pyrethroids, carbamates, these classes of pesticides are fairly non-specific, whereas the BT protein is highly specific. It's specific against these lepidopteran insects 
doesn't affect earthworms, doesn't affect honeybees, doesn't affect other pests like white flies or aphids or thrips. Um, but it takes out the biggest issue a farmer might have in his field, which allows him to be more selective and more judicious on how he treats those other insects. Yeah. And that's actually answered another one of my questions when you said it, uh, it doesn't affect bees, because I was going to ask if it would have any kind of effect with them. Um, bees wanting to take the nectar and pollinate other plants but now it, it, the the beauty of bt there's two really highly desirable characteristics about this protein first and foremost it has a high degree of toxicity against the target host among the most potent um, uh, proteins for for the insect toxicity secondly it's extremely specific uh, think of uh, think of the BT protein as a key, and the insect has a lock. The key fits very precisely into the lock, and and only the insects that have the right lock does the key fit. And that's the lepidopteran insects. Other insects, other organisms like even invertebrates, uh, earthworms, other insects found in the soil, humans, animals, they don't have the right lock, so the key doesn't fit, so it doesn't work. Uh, it's one of the marvels of, of nature. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, I'm sorry for, for butting in here. We have a guy in the chat room and he's bringing up some, uh, yeah, it's probably an anti-GMO guy, but he, he does bring up something interesting. I want to hear what you have to say about it. Sure. Um, uh, you have to buy seeds every year, presumably, uh, if you're, you, if you're uh, planting the, the g genetically modified stuff. Uh, you have to buy seeds every year as they don't reproduce like natural seeds do. Can I? Uh, it's a. Yeah. I think he's basically hinting that it's it's a way to get farmers to cough up money or, or something. If I would be able to say, as yes. I live in a farming background, you always have to buy seeds every year because you're never going to have enough seeds from the previous crop because you're harvesting the seeds with the plant. So, yeah. Well, there, there's, there's two parts, uh, Marty, that, that come up from this chat room, and one of them is a big misconception, and that is somehow the seeds are changed so that they don't uh, germinate in the subsequent year. This is all part of an urban myth that came out of a technology that was originally patented by a seed company, Monsanto, eventually acquired Delta and Pine. It's called Terminator technology, and it was a very clever but very complex proposal for how to keep seeds from germinating from one year to another unless you intervened. Um, the reality is it never got off the ground. It never made it. Uh, that myth persists for the last 20 years, but if you look up their patent, they abandoned their patent. They never filed any reduction to practice. There's never been any data, but the myth persists that somehow this is true, that we've somehow changed the seeds. Now, the other aspect is um, you have to look at the specifics of individual crops. So, for example, corn is grown as a hybrid. It's been grown as a hybrid since the late 1920s, early 1930s. No one saves corn seed in the United States or in Europe, maybe in a few places in Africa and Asia, but it's grown as a hybrid, and the hybrid is where two parents come together to produce a hybrid seed that has increased vigor and characteristics just for that one generation. If you keep the seed for the next generation, those characteristics will segregate away. A lot of vegetable crops are hybrids, and they convey a certain amount of vigor that is better than either parent individually. Um, so in the case of corn, no one saves seed anyway. In the case of cotton and soybean, which are also GMOs, those are open pollinated varieties, and theoretically you could keep the seed in subsequent generations. Now in the U.S. and many other countries, farmers sign an agreement that say they will not do it. They will not keep their seed from generation to generation. Many farmers who are hoping... Uh, 
to make money on their crop, don't save the seed anyway. Saving seed, you accumulate diseases, problems, quality characteristics, germination. If you're a, a farmer with a lot at stake, you want to buy new seed every year because the germination rates are higher and you have an assurance of quality. And you also so you're, you're getting rid of you're ensuring that you get rid of genetic defects and stuff like that's that's basically the point. Is that it? Not so much genetic defects, but just growing your crop in the field, you end up picking up diseases. Plants get sick all the time. Yeah. And if you're not fastidious about the way you saved your seed, you could pick up some fungal diseases that carry uh -huh. on your disease or viral diseases. Buying certified seed means that the seed has been inspected, it's been grown under more stringent conditions to ensure that the seed doesn't carry those deficiencies. Plus, every year there are new varieties of seed that give you better and better yield. So if you keep your seed for three or four years and your neighbor is buying new seed where he gets a couple bushels more per acre per year, after four or five years, you're 10 bushels behind. You can't afford that. Yeah. And if, uh, considering my country's background with uh, uh, the potato farming, it was all because it was all essentially the same strain of potatoes. Um, mm -hmm. It just took that one disease to hit one batch, and that was it. Almost the entire country was wiped out because it affected all of the crops because essentially there was no hybrids. They weren't mixing one type with another to protect against a specific strain. Right. And, and one of the concerns people have is biodiversity or diversity of crops in the field. Um, and people talk about the potato famine as an example. And in 1970, there was a rust, a, a viral disease that, that went through um, corn plants, or actually it's not a viral disease, it's a fungal disease, a rust. It went through a whole 25% of the corn crop was eliminated through the disease. There is a lot of diversity because there is a lot of competition among seed companies. For example, Monsanto sells a little over 500 different kinds of corn on a global basis every year. Uh, so we can hear you typing. Oh, there. that's me. Sorry, I thought I'd muted. Yeah, uh, yeah I was going to say I'm muted. Sorry, pumpkin, I meant. <laughs> uh, carry on. Sorry. Force of habit. Any, anyway, we, we, we produce 500 different kinds of hybrids a year. On an average, we probably replace about 100 of those. And we introduce new disease resistances and varieties that have different characteristics. And it's a very competitive field. As a consequence, the biodiversity is stronger than it ever has been before because there is a lot of research going into it. In the past, when things were more static in the seed industry, there wasn't the incentive to invest in, in, invest in new technologies and new varieties. Now there's a lot of competition, and that's good for farmers. And it's because farmers buy seed every year because of these traits. Yep. Um, we'll go. There was a question from the chat room that related to an earlier topic, so we'll jump back. Zilla, you've got the question queued up. Yeah, there's from Micro uh, Bloganism in the chat room. Wanted to know, Vant, uh, sorry, wanted to know, is the BT gene in GM crops identical to the gene in B. Durinigenesis? Um, yes. Um, the now, since we first put the first gene in, um, there are a number of different ones that have had changes. Uh, the very earliest ones were uh, uh, identical. I think there was one amino acid out of 1,179 that were different. Um, and that was just the second amino acid. It's, uh, it's a minor characteristic. Um, but it was essentially the same. And in fact, um, in order to be able to commercialize it, we had to show that it had exactly the same specificity, exactly the same activity, both against target and non-target pests. 
which involve doing activities and feeding studies for earthworms and honeybees. And I don't even know how you get earthworms to eat the protein, but that's another story. Um, but honeybees, earthworms, all sorts of uh, feeding studies with birds and quail and rats, just to show that it's exactly the same. Um, now, since then, there's um, understanding of the specifics of how the BT protein actually works. And there's mixes and matches to improve activity through molecular engineering. In other words, we understand the 3D structure. We understand where the receptors are. We understand how it interacts with the organism, and we can make slight tweaks. Think of it as improving the original pharmaceutical of penicillin with derivatives that are more active. Um, that is actually a wonder of science, and it's, and it's unbelievable how sophisticated all that work has gotten, but it is very precise. And the requirement is always to show that it still retains the degree of specificity that it previously had. In other words, still working on your target pest, but not expanding it beyond to insects that you didn't want to control or organisms that would not benefit from the presence of the protein. Okay, and I'll take this opportunity to hopefully welcome Kitch. Are you there? Uh, yes. How's my audio? Absolutely perfect. It's Terrible. actually Grand. good for once. Remarkably perfect, actually. <laughs> Scared what perfect. happened? Uh, let's not jinx it just yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, this will be a good chance, Kitch. You've just come in, so I know you've got a heap of questions for Fred because you work in a similar field, so how about it? Uh, yeah, sure. I don't know what's been asked, so if, if, I, if, if I ask something that's been asked, uh, just, just, just let me know. Um, uh, I know that you've uh, worked in Hawaii. What was that like to, to do science in a, such a beautiful state? <laughs> well, the job I had in Hawaii was heading up our, um, our overall seed operations in Hawaii. Hawaii is a beautiful place. Um, and we utilize Hawaii as a nursery. Um, there's really not much research there as so much as it is a nursery for corn. Now, we employed almost a thousand people in Hawaii, very hardworking, wonderful group of people. Uh, I enjoyed my time there. But in our nurseries in Hawaii, we grew corn 10 feet at a time. It's called a short row equivalent. It's 10 to 15 plants per row, 20, 25 square feet. And we do over 2 million of those on an annual basis. So 2 million 10-foot rows on fields all over the island of Hawaii. Um, we keep track of each of those rows. The idea as a nursery was that we were trying to move the genetics in a specific way. Generating a new variety is like turning Rubik's Cube. You have to get all the panels to line up. And no matter how skilled you are, you still have to turn the panels a certain number of times. In Hawaii, all we did was turn panels. All we did was do crosses, set the genetics, collect the seed, plant the seed, send the seed off, get it analyzed. We did very little analysis per se. We were more about rearranging the genetics to have the plants look the way we know we wanted them to look. Plant breeding nowadays is such a scientific process. I am amazed and absolute in awe of how much we know about what we want out of a corn plant, a soybean plant, a cotton plant, what it should look like on a molecular basis. And that's the big change over the last 10 to 15 years. It is a true triumph of science. Absolutely amazing. I loved working in Hawaii. The people there were just wonderful. Um, and it is a gorgeous place to be. I also know how to make really good Mai Tais now. <laughs> I think me and you will have a discussion about that later. <laughs> good. So, so uh, okay, we, uh, I'd like to 
uh, ask about this. Uh, the, the guy in the chat room keeps going, but I, I think these are, he's asking questions that need to be brought up now that we have someone who can actually respond to them. Uh, he started talking about nutrition and GMOs, that, that there's basically, uh, basically if it's genetically modified, it has no nutrition in it. Uh, obviously that's wrong, but I'd like to hear exactly, I mean, what, where does this come from? What is, uh, I'll, I'll just put it like this instead. What is the point of modifying um, anything? Uh, if, if, if you can just dumb it down to like the intelligence level of a five-year-old. You, <laughs> wow, you're being why, generous. Yeah, I'm being generous here. I, I got it. Why well, I, modify anything? Well, um, the why is so that you can increase the genetic capability to provide traits or characteristics that improve the production of that particular crop. Putting a BT gene into corn makes it resistant to certain insect pests, so you spray fewer insecticides, which is more sustainable in the long run. Now, the misconception about genetically engineered crops is that they are somehow massively changed from what you ordinarily see. But if I were to show you a GMO corn plant next to a non-GMO corn plant, they would look identical, look identical to the naked eye. So think about it this way. If you have a library of books, say 50,000 books. The genetic capacity for corn is about 50,000 genes. So think of the DNA of corn as 50,000 books on a shelf. Each book is a gene, a distinct beginning, middle, and end. Each gene tells a story. Each gene has a function. What we do when we genetically engineer the plants is we take one more book, just one more book, and put it on the shelf. We know exactly where we put it in a very precise way. We make sure it doesn't interfere with all the other books. We make sure it is in a place where it can be read, where it can be understood, and that it doesn't disrupt the rest of the plant. So when we're doing putting that one gene in, we'll generate 10,000 plants, and we'll go through a very complex process of eliminating ones which don't look quite so good, which don't have the characteristics we want, and we'll winnow it down to a very small handful. And then we'll do tests, which is called substantial equivalence. We'll grow the plant that has the gene compared to its exact parent without the gene. And they have to be identical under conditions where we analyze all the things that are coming out of it. So for instance, in corn, we look at the growth characteristics, we make sure that it still has the same uh, growth patterns, maturity levels, um, that the corn that comes out has the same amount of protein, same amount of uh, carbohydrates, same amount of oil, same amount of fiber. It has to be substantially equivalent. In other words, indistinguishable from any other plant. Our goal is to provide a trait that is so specific. A farmer, what he wants is he wants his old corn that he's used to growing, but he now wants it insect resistant. So it's exactly the same. And if it wasn't, it wouldn't be good enough. Um, so in terms of nutrition, there are no nutritional differences. It is, right. it is substantially equivalent. And if it wasn't, we wouldn't be able to bring it forward. If it right, wasn't, because, it would because have to people be wouldn't labeled. buy it if nothing else. Well, it would have to be labeled differently if it wasn't yeah. the same. Yeah. Um, I go ahead, pumpkin. I'm trying to think of a way to word this. It's something I'm somewhat curious about because dealing with the um, person in the chat who completely ignored what you were saying, yeah, it slightly irritated me. Um, whenever you're doing shows like this or you're having any kind of debate or discussion, do you ever find it grates on you when people demand evidence or make these assumptions and promote urban myths about GMOs, ignore it? Because there's one in the chat that I saw that made me almost punch my screen in anger, which was that you're putting AIDS in plants, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's um, those things. Does that ever grind you down? 
You know, um, I can always understand people having questions about the technology. It's new and it's different. It's not what they're used to. And it's so much easier to doubt um, than it is to, to believe. Because quite frankly, when you talk to people, they'll say, well, why do we need GMO plants? I go to the supermarket and there's plenty of food. Uh, obviously, that's not so important. Well, it is to the farmer who grows this and how he grows it and its efficiency. And, and it does have a big fit. Um, I can understand reluctance. What I don't understand is people completely not wanting to listen. And if you hear something, well, okay, try to find out where this falls out. Where does the logic, if you were an investigator or a detective, where does the logic fall out? So if, for instance, the myth about Terminator genes, it continues and continues and continues. So I say, look, Show me a permit where we've actually ever tested it. Show me where it doesn't work. When we brought BT cotton to India, the Indian regulatory officials required certain molecular tests to show that it wasn't there. I said, why don't you just take the seeds and plant them? And if they don't grow, give me a call. He sends me an email three months later. He says, they all grew. You must have done something to them. I said, then plant them again. People can find the evidence, but they have to be open to the possibilities. Um, it is, it's just one of those things. You um, can never satisfy everyone, but you have to be able to satisfy yourself and other people who are willing to listen. And there's, there's another issue here, isn't it? Um, we can uh, provide a certain amount of food for the human population, given the uh, you know the uh, farmland available, um, there are two ways to provide more as the population grows. One is to get more farmland. Another is to make uh, better use of uh, more efficient use of the farm farmland that's available. Right. I mean. Uh, are are we gonna tell people sorry? Don't have kids because we can't provide any more food. They're they're just gonna starve. Sorry, I mean well, we obviously have to get more food somehow. I think I think if you talk to most experts in this field, they'll say that it is in our best interest to freeze current agricultural acres at their current level, and then in. in invoke something called sustainable intensification. In other words, work on improving better use of the existing land. Yep. And therefore, you will be able to produce more per acre. Because remember, if, 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 you, if you do take more land away to go into agriculture, you're taking it away from housing, you're taking it away from recreation or conservation, other places that are important to people. Now there Cutting is a down third, rainforest. I mean, that's exactly. not good. Well, a third way is, is looking at reducing the amount of waste. Uh, according to some WHO statistics I've seen, most people agree that we waste between 30 to 50% of fruits and vegetables, for example, or certain other kinds of foodstuffs. So I cringe when I hear people say, oh, I will never eat bread that has preservatives in it. And so producers then start producing bread without preservatives. Well, then you buy a loaf of bread, you eat a couple of pieces, the next day, two days later, it's hard as a rock and, and it's green. Uh, that all goes in the waste bin because you obviously can't eat it. The lack of preservatives actually exacerbates the problem that you have, which is food waste. All that food, all that grain that was produced, it made it into the bread, it was marketed, it made it to your table, and now it's in the trash bin. Now, if you can buy just what you need to eat, that's fine. But I personally, I buy sandwich bread. I make my own sandwich at work, and I look for ones with preservatives because I want it to last the week. I have this problem with wasting food because I am involved with agriculture. I know what it takes to produce this stuff, and I'm so grateful. Um, I can't afford to waste it. 
Yeah, I, 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 I'm sort of guilty of wasting a lot of food myself. But on, on the plus side, uh, here uh, in, in Sweden, and especially in my hometown, we actually we, we throw food away in, a, in specific trash bins because it's being used as biofuel. That so is, it, a, it's that is not, another, it's not a complete waste. That's, that's, that's very good. I know countries like Sweden are, are very progressive. I, my daughter uh, lives in New York City and, and they have a very aggressive program for composting and reusing um, uh, foodstuffs and food waste that, that is quite laudable. Um, but it, um, the best use of it obviously is for human consumption. Yeah. Okay, we'll, uh, Zilla, you've got a question from the chat room then. A question, we've got a question from Pumpkin after that, and we do have a caller waiting. So, Zilla, you go up first. Cool, yeah, this one's from Board to Bits, who I first want to ask when he's next going to bring a video out, because I'm really <laughs> waiting for it. When are you um, going to read the Lolcat's Bible? <laughs> yeah, um, and Board to Bits asks... Do the seed reserves maintain a copy of all original strains in case there is a future unforeseen negative to the gene manipulation? Um, there are a lot of seed banks. And um, it, it, to give you an idea, when we generate a new variety of corn, uh, we do it not as a genetically engineered variety. We do it as traditional breeding, so it doesn't have GMOs in it. And then we add the, the traits to it later. Um, it's not intuitive, but if you think about it, we constantly have new traits that are being upgraded and improved, and we have new varieties that are constantly being improved. So you have two parallel tracks of, of research going on. In our case, we generate new varieties of corn, and then when we have new traits, we cross the new traits instead of the old traits into the new varieties. So we do maintain those, and they are maintained in a lot of different ways. And then we also provide, we, we provide seed to people in the EU, for example, that are uh, traditional non-GMO seeds, excuse me, of some derivatives of the varieties that we grow in the United States. So there is a reservoir of GMO and non-GMO seeds that are constantly archived and kept. Okay. Does that make sense? Surprisingly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> if it makes sense to yeah. Pumpkin, you're doing something right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, Pumpkin, you, uh, you had a question next, and we do have a caller waiting. So, Pumpkin? Um, my question actually ties in fairly well with the last one. Um, it's not so much to do with backlogging uh, what you've done in case there's future problems, but I'm guessing that when you find a new strain and add it to the plant, it's done so in a very controlled environment. Um, like it's not that you're just going to start going, hey, we made new seeds, throw it to the wind! <laughs> Is yeah, it, it, it is. Um, it's a very complex process, actually. For us here at Monsanto, we have a five-step process. It starts with discovery. There's four intermediate phases, which talk about proof of concept, early development, uh, advanced development, pre-launch, and launch. So a uh, total of six phases, four internal ones. Discovery is all laboratory, all in highly controlled conditions. In order to take a new gene and put it in, we have internal review committees to be able to assess the potential dangers, issues, concerns that might happen. If we want to go out to the field, we have to apply to the United States Department of Agriculture, EPA, other organizations, and confirm for them why we want to do it, what we want to do, where the source of the gene is, what it's going to look like. And then all those studies are highly regulated. They have very strict requirements on reporting and planting and border rows and isolations and monitoring. Um, remember, all these things take uh, liability. And if we were to go out with something that caused some sort of problem, even a minor one, we would be liable for it. Um, so we take great care to make sure that what we do 
is um, well controlled and well identified. By the time we hit proof of concept and early development, we have a pretty good idea that there aren't going to be issues with safety or security or, or uh, some other issues. It's more about performance, but safety for us is first and foremost. And, and in these processes, we look at things like, does it have potential antigenicity? Would it be an allergen? Would it be a pest if it got out? Would it, um, would it interfere with other crops? Would it limit the functions or the opportunities a farmer might have? All those are, are considered. Uh, this is hard work, and it's very precise and very carefully done. It's very expensive. So to give you an example on the five different stages, when we start off in discovery, there may be two or three people working on it. By the time it hits launch, there's probably a couple of hundred on it. Um, so, and that's probably a 10 or 15 year period. I'd answer your question there, Pumpkin. Pumpkin. It, it answered it spectacularly. Um, it is genuinely heartening to hear that not only are you setting preliminary controlled states, but referring back to the seed banks that even if something completely unforeseen happens down the line, that you're ready to step in. And the liability to have to say our ass is on the line if this goes bad. Yep. Genuinely good to hear. Yep. Okay. It sure is. All right, we do have a caller. Uh, long time no see. Um, Casey, how are you doing? I've been doing all right. Okay, and I, uh, well, you've got some questions for Fred, so fire away. All right. Here goes nothing. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> You know how there's endangered species of plant, like for example, the loneliest palm, palm all, all the way in the, the well, islands in the Indian Ocean. One of the islands in the Indian Ocean, essentially this is considered the only species of palm. But however, I was thinking that, do you think the, the possibility of say, G, of a, well, you, gen, doing a, um, Some Casey, genetic engineering, but at the same time, uh, Casey, you're breaking up I'm badly. Uh, the wild type genes, um, uh, to we'll be able to allow it to do things like have disease okay, um, resistance and all. Sorry, all that. sorry, uh, Casey, yeah. you're breaking up badly. Can you try switching off your webcam and asking your question again? We couldn't make out a lot of that. Okay, try again. All right. Yeah, that's Sorry for the, oh, for the interruption. Okay. As I was saying, I was thinking, you know, um, what if like genetic engineering could be used for uh, things like conservation of plants? Like, I'm not talking about like get rid of the wild type or anything, but like adding some disease resistance to it. Um, you know, that's an interesting concept. I hadn't even thought about the improving um, near extinct varieties in terms of plant preservation. Um, it, it gets to be a, a, a convoluted conversation because if you genetically engineer it, then it's no longer what it used to be. I think in those cases, it's better served as trying to cross it with something that's a close relative in order to maintain or provide resistance or characteristics or try to identify preserves or areas where you can plant it where it will survive. Um, it is um, many times, at least when I've heard talk about the concern about deforestation, it's the loss of, of habitat and in particular kinds of uh, plants in that particular geographic area. I think conservation is a great opportunity, and I, and that goes back to if you have increased pressure from populations for more and more land, intensifying the amount of production you have on the existing land allows you to then set across or set aside even more and more land for conservation. 
when when we lose a plant, some part of us all dies. Whenever we lose an animal or plant as part of our existence, some part of all of us dies along with it. And that's something that we shouldn't abuse uh, and try to make sure that we hold on to. So I agree with you, Casey, but I don't think GMO or genetic engineering is the way to go. That's my opinion. Okay, Casey, um, you had another question. I understand. Uh, You're breaking up again. Yes. Going off the topic of plants, I'm not sure if you heard about it or not, but well, have you heard of the genetic engineering of things like mosquitoes and all that, and like fruit flies? There are a number of... Uh, TSA, your microphone's breaking up quite a bit. You may just want to post what the it in chat. idea is to do is try to uh, make them sterile and then like release them out into the environment. I know they've they've worked on that in in a number of different agencies and sterilizing um, males, for example, or, or I don't even remember if it was male or males or females, so that the population would self-stabilize to a very, very low level. Um, if you understand enough about the ecosystem, if you understand enough about the, the life of the insect and how it interacts with everything, yeah, okay, but those make me a little nervous. Um, I just don't know enough. The nice thing about plants is you look at the plant and you don't like it, you just pull it up and it's gone, it's dead. It's not going to be evasive, it's not going to hide, it's not going to go to other places. Um, plants have roots and they're easy to mitigate problems. Okay, is that everything, Casey? Well, I was going to uh, I'm an athlete. Uh, well, Casey, you um, sorry, we're going. I think we'll have to leave you because sorry, um, Casey, oh. Casey, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I'm afraid I'm we'll have to drop you because we can't hear you at all. Then, sex and like something, um, Casey, Casey, yeah, so you're gonna have to go uh, post the question and we'll ask it for you. Yeah, your line quality is terrible, we can, can't make you out at all now. Okay, sorry, but we'll have to leave you there. Yeah, thanks. Thanks anyway, Casey. Sorry about the connection problems. And so we had a chat room question from Vicky. Uh, Zilla, can you read that one? Yep, Veggie Vicky asks us, um, since we're lucky enough to have some Monsanto expertise, um, could we ask you to talk about whether or not glyphosate, sorry, glyphosate by accumulates in humans as well as its shelf life in water soil or in water stroke soil. So the, the question is, does glyphosate accumulate in humans? I think that's, yeah, I think that's what she's getting yeah, that's, at. That's what it seems to, to be. Yeah, there, a glyphosate is, a, is the chemical name for a group of herbicides and that have been around since the early 1970s. It's a um, very common herbicide and it's an extremely safe herbicide. There are residues that are found in food and they do get into the human body, but they do not accumulate in the human body. The characteristics of glyphosate from the experts that I've talked to indicate to me that it's water soluble and the extremely low levels that are found in food are well underneath the, um, I mean, 50-fold thousand times in some instances or uh, below levels of concern for glyphosate exposure. So it is true, yes, glyphosate is found in, in uh, food and that it does get into our bodies, but it does not accumulate. People do not accumulate glyphosate. And the amounts that are found are so infinitesimally small that they are not a concern. In fact, um, despite all the debate, it's, re it's, it's constantly undergoing recertification. And um, in the EU, the Germans who um, 
were responsible for redoing the recertification of glyphosate in this last round. And they've just come out with the conclusion that glyphosate is among the safest herbicides used in the world today. Okay, um, who was, I can't remember the order of the questions were in after that. There was another one coming. I think it was Zilla. Or there Brown. was there was a follow-up to, yeah. to that. Maybe we should take that. Yeah, we'll take that one that just came in. Uh, with glyphosate, can I also ask him to comment on the IARC's recent classification of glyphosate as a probable carcinogen? Uh, yeah, there's, um, I've, I've talked to a number of, of people in our organization about this and uh, the IARC is one of four agencies of the World Health Organization who evaluates different chemistries. Three others have also evaluated glyphosate and said that it's of no concern. The IARC looks at the possibility of, of this and they came up with a different conclusion. They don't look extensively at different studies. They looked at a small number of studies. Um, we disagree with the classification that came out by the IARC. We don't believe it's been um, adequate or takes into account all the research that's been done, but it's a difference of opinion between us and the IARC. Um, as I said, there are other agencies within the WHO that have no problem with glyphosate. And in fact, it's classified as a herbicide which is a category E herbicide in the U.S. by the EPA, which means that it is evidence that it is not a carcinogen. So the question ends up being, um, okay, there's debate about it. Let's, let's go to a third party. Let's get some studies done. Let's resolve that. But um, up until now, and this has been over the last 35 years or so, Glyphosate has always had a clean bill of health. Okay. Um, well, Kitch, we know you had a store of questions and you haven't spoken much, so we'll let you come in here. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, uh, just trying to figure out what's been said and what, what hasn't been said. Um, just on BT itself, I know that there's a number of different BT products, um, or the BT genes, cry A, cry B, and all those are they from the same bacter bacterial strain or are they as in these are just different proteins that the bacteria produce it or are they from a variety of bt strains and has um any of these bacterial toxins been altered uh by pr uh, protein engineering just to improve their uh eff eff efficiency the answer to your question is yes yes sometimes and yes <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the first isolation, for a long time, there were thought to be a relatively narrow group of cry proteins or BT proteins. Uh, and they were the cry A group, and then they expanded it to a total of 14 different serotypes of BT that produced different kinds of proteins. Early on, it was appreciated that there was a BT that produced a protein that was active against dipterins or mosquitoes. It was called the mosquito factor. There was another group of proteins that were only active on the lepidopterans. As time has gone on and our ability to sequence bacteria and genes, we've come to appreciate the world of BTs as being relatively rich in diversity with lots of different kinds of BT proteins with activities on a number of different classes of insects. Now, at first, all we used was those basic classes. Then we started making chimera proteins, which had pieces of different ones to increase or improve the activity or expand the activity among a particular class. So even among a CRY1 AEC protein, for example, has very good activity against cotton bollworm, but poor activity against army fallworm. So we figured out which BTs are good on fallworm, which ones are good on earworm, and made kind of a chimeric that improved their activity. 
Since then, we're now looking at even more sophisticated ways of doing that engineering. And it's a good thing. It is very similar to what you see in the antibiotic industry of pharmaceuticals. So they came out with the basic beta-lactam antibiotics like penicillin and basic ones, and then they found modifications and changes which help keep the antibiotics ahead of resistance development. We're at a similar point, except that we have all the knowledge and information that has been developed over decades in the pharmaceutical industry. And we have the advantage that we're trying to be good stewards to the technology to minimize the development of resistance. For all those reasons, it is uh, a really interesting characteristic of the industry, excuse me, that we have the ability to um, make improved proteins with improved activity. As I'd said before, that just because they came from natural sources and they were put together, that doesn't change our obligation to continue to test and make sure that they retain the characteristics which made them so desirable to begin with. That is their specificity and their potency of activity and their lack of activity on non-intended targets. So the answer is yes, but it is a triumph in modern science for how sophisticated we can be. And I'm quite optimistic about that. It'll help um, us for a long time. And uh, do you know, about, just about on the resistance, do you know, I know for, for antibiotics, we, there's various strategies out there to try to combat the emergence of resistance. Uh, is there any strategies that exist to prevent the emergence of BT resistance in the uh, agricultural sector? Yes, there are. Um, before we launched our product, BT cotton product here in the United States and BT corn, we, we consulted the best entomologists that we could find. And we had some very skilled ones here, both in the United States and Australia, um, Europe, but primarily the United States and Australia, um, and got their opinions and came up with a program of, of what's called refugia. So in this system, a farmer buys BT cotton seed, for example, and he can plant 80% of his farm to BT cotton, but keeps 20% out of BT cotton. In that 20%, he can treat with traditional insecticides, but it provides a refuge, an area where the insects can survive without the presence of selection. So then when they cross with the with the selected ones on your BT field, you don't amplify up the resistance, you actually dilute the resistance. And although complicated, this strategy has held off resistance extremely well here in the United States. And in fact, um, in Arizona, where they have some very strong practitioners of this, and it is a, a condition of our registration here in the United States to practice this strategy, uh, they've held off resistance in Arizona for the last 20 years, and it's maintained the value of BT cotton in Arizona, which is quite noteworthy. And just on the, actually, uh, just relating it back to uh, antibiotic resistance, when that emerges, I know f the virulence of the bacteria usually decreases. And when resistance emerges in insects, does that affect the insects um, in any way? It, compared it depends, to the wild type? Or. It depends on the insect. Um, from many of the experts I've talked to, there is a fitness cost associated with it. Uh, so a fitness cost associated with the maintaining the resistance. And in the absence of selection, the, the resistance pressure um, goes down. In other words, you you um, and the example I gave earlier about white flies in Arizona, there's a when they was the resistance of white flies to pyrethroids did generate uh, it was a fitness cost. So if you stop spraying the pyrethroids, the number of resistant white flies goes down dramatically. Um, it is a, a, a function of of the insect itself. Some insects have it, some don't, and it's a case-by-case -case basis. 
and okay, um, it's okay, entered. We should probably take the call. Yeah, now. he's been waiting, waiting. quite patiently. <laughs> um, Kitch, we'll go to you after this. So that's all right. Yeah, that's uh, that's Grant. Yeah. yeah. Uh, caller, Valtz, are you there? Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, good. Good evening. How are you doing? Oh evening <laughs> well whatever yeah uh you're on with uh, dr perlak so what's your question i have only had experience with genetic engineering using agrobacterium and i wonder if there are any better methods used now because it has only possibility of random insertion so Maybe there are newer methods which can insert DNA in the precise spot, not, not just randomly. Um, th that's a good question, and the answer is yes, there are improved methods. Agrobacterium is somewhat random. I mean, it, it does have some basis homology for where it inserts, although it is such a low level of homology, it appears to be somewhat random. Um, the advantage of, of being able to generate large numbers of plants is that you can then select the ones where you're very happy with where the insertion took place. So, for example, a, a standard of satisfaction is that we get insertion of our gene from the borders of agrobacterium and that when it inserts, we don't have any deletions or insertions and in that it's not in a coding sequence. It's not in a regulatory sequence. It doesn't appear to, to disrupt any other promoter or have any read-through sequences. We can be very selective on that end. Now, there are new technologies like the uh, DNA editing and the CRISPR technology, which have the ability to knock out traits and to be able to um, alter genes within the chromosome. Those are very valuable technologies and the potential is only beginning to be understood. I think that's the next generation of what's going to be um, really cool part of science. Uh, none of this stays stagnant. None of it stays the same. This is always changing, always improving. And there are new and, and better ways to do this. And I'm sure 10 years from now, someone will look at what we did and say, boy, was that dated. Uh, and it'll be true. OK, do you have anything else, Valtz? No, I don't have anything else. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for the Thanks. call. Thanks for calling in. Have a good evening. OK, um, Kitch, we'll go back to your questions there. Uh, sure. I was going to ask: Has there any been? Is there any research at the moment looking at other uh, toxins from other bacteria? Uh, you know, it's been a rich field for a long period of time. People have looked at toxins from uh, Phytorhabdus. So there, there's a number of other toxins that have specificity for insects or other pests. Uh, none of them seems to have the specificity or the potency that BT toxins have. Um, they found other proteins that do have some activity, um, but I don't know of any that have made it commercial just yet. Um, and, and some of these proteins, um, well, a good example is uh, using things like RNAi uh, or RNA. RNA inhibition or suppression or whatever. We have a, a, new, a new possible product coming out for corn rootworm control that targets uh, a specific gene in the corn rootworm. Uh, the advantage of that is you can turn, kill the insect by uh, disrupting a process that is unique to the insect. That is very laser-like focus. Um, and it doesn't require a BT gene to do that. Um, that is really cool stuff. That's cool science. Okay, and then you'll have this. Um, oh, carry on. Sorry, this, uh, this kind of, that's really, that's very, that's very interesting. How, how, does, how do they get the RNAi into the cells? Like, how, how does it, how is it, is it just taken by uh, endocytosis or is there a delivery mechanism involved? It, or? In, in this particular case, it's introduced uh, as a sequence through agrobacterium transformation. Now, people have been looking at 
can the organism take up RNA directly? And um, could, you, could you use it as a, a, a prep over plants? And there's different success levels associated with that. Uh, it's still so new and so early that I could tell you something and it might prove to be wrong tomorrow. Um, it's so, it, but it is a very interesting area of research. Um, but in this particular case, it goes in with a coding sequence that produces an RNA that is inhibitory to the, to the specific insect. And it'll be inherited in the plant as part of the regular genetic makeup of the plant. But uh, how, does it, uh, how does the insect uh, take it up? Or When the insect eats it, in this particular case, the corn rootworm, when it eats the corn root, it, the RNA actually goes from, it, it is not disrupted in the gut of the insect. The RNA actually gets into the gut and is somehow transported and kills the insect. By the way, that is one of the limitations. Some insects do it and some insects don't. Some insects just won't take any RNA out. Some will take lots. Okay. Is that to do with the, the acidity, acidity of the gut? or There's a whole number of different factors. Proteases, nucleases, acidity, pH. Um, uh, it's pretty complicated. Oh. So basically it's magic. <laughs> <laughs> Now, a pumpkin, don't, don't, don't be saying that. People will think that it's just random. It's very precise. This is what I, I – know, this is I hard know. work. I mean, that's what I always tell people. This is such hard work. And it is a marvel that we get this stuff done. Um, I'm just amazed. No one would have ever – if you would have told me at the beginning of my career I'd be talking to you about this level of sophistication, I'd have never said that were possible. Um, okay, we do have another chat room question, so Zillar, take it away. Yeah, this one is it's again from Board to Bits. Uh, Board, why are you still here? You're meant to be making me a video. <laughs> does Dr. Fred think that GMO derived products should, um, sorry, does Dr. Fred think that GMO derived products should be identified as such? Yes or no, and why? Uh, um, my answer is no because of the way the laws are structured for labeling that I'm most uh, familiar with in the United States. So in the United States, when you look at the label on the back of a package of food, it talks about the nutritional capability of the food, what it has, how much fiber, protein, carbohydrate. It is not about the process for how it was grown or where it was grown or what the genetic capability was. It is about the product. And under that scenario, if that is the way things are labeled, then GMO products should not be labeled as long as the products they produce are indistinguishable for ones grown without GMOs. Now, I can give you a case where we have a product called Vistiv Oil, which is by genetic manipulation, we change the oil makeup of soybeans. We eliminate the polyunsaturated fatty acids from soybeans or reduce them so that hydrogenation is no longer required, so trans fats are no longer produced. We produce actually what's called a higher oleic oil in these soybeans. Those particular soybeans should be labeled as high oleic soybeans because they are different. They are different because they have been genetically engineered. They should be labeled. Something that isn't different shouldn't be labeled. Now, if people want to change the labeling laws and how labels are made and what they mean, then fine. Change the laws and then you should maybe label them or not label them. But if you're going to do that for GMOs, then where does it stop? Well, I want to know what state it was grown in. I want to know what herbicides it was used. And if it's GMO or non-GMO, was it insect or herbicide or, or fungal resistance or nematode resistance or, or virus resistance? And how are people going to make heads or tails of that? Also, as long as they have the rules that are just about the product, then I'd say no. 
So basically, otherwise, we'll end up with buying a packet of food and an, you know, a manual that's as big as an encyclopedia to go along with it. Well, it, it, you know, the, there are rules to this game, and we all play by the rules. And if they want to change the rules, okay, fine. Um, but it has to be information that's useful to the consumer. So I can show you a bottle of corn oil from a non-GMO corn, corn crop and a bottle of corn oil from a GMO corn crop, and they are completely indistinguishable. There is no chemical test, no process you can utilize to tell one from the other because there is no DNA, no protein in that oil. It's a chemically defined substance. As a consequence, there are no differences. So what does the label tell you? It tells you absolutely nothing. Um, I have another question which slightly relates to that. Um, many people would say that a big deal with foods and is basically a GMO versus organic. Do you think that there should be a slight difference in names considering that all food has underwent some form of genetic modification? Take, for example, bananas, which used to be pure seed. And the fact that organic food is just that, except it hasn't been done in a lab. Well, a change to either one. Yeah. First off, there are there is a difference between traditional breeding and genetic engineering, as what it's commonly called, because it's transgenic. In other words, BT corn could only happen if we intervene. Now there is some evidence. Uh, Jonathan Jones from the Sainsbury Center published a paper that talked about uh, researchers who found that sweet potatoes have been engineered inadvertently by agrobacterium millennia ago, decades, centuries, however long ago it took. Um, so those are natural processes. But when you talk about something like BT corn, it's clearly different from traditional breeding. By the same token, they do use chemicals on organic foods. They do use chemicals on organic crops, but it's a specific list of chemicals. Things like copper sulfate, the BT organism is okay to use on organic crops. Uh, pyrethrum, which is the natural extract from uh, the, the chrysanthemums that gave rise to pyrethroids, a chemical analog, um, those are acceptable under organic um, venues, but um, pyrethroid, which would be the chemical analog of it, would be unacceptable. I think there's a lot of room for coexistence between organic and um, traditional and biotech research. I think that, that that's fine. Every farmer I know would prefer to be as organic as they possibly can. Inputs cost him money, whether it's fertilizer or pesticides or herbicides, and he's got to be profitable to make it to the next level. So he's trying to maximize all the value he can. If he didn't have to use those inputs on his farm, he wouldn't. Um, but I do think, um, I mean, I grow herbs in my backyard organically because I'm too lazy to put fertilizer and I get more than enough so I don't have to not many things eat basil. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and it smells awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I think, uh, like I say, we're coming up to the end of the show. So, well, I want to play a little bit of devil's advocate. There's one, the reaction you must get from when you meet strangers that you work for Monsanto. I mean, how do you respond to that? You know, because there are people who just... Like we said before the show, they just look at you as if you, ha you do have horns growing out of your head when you mention the M word, so, so to speak. Yeah, it. Um, I've worked long enough and hard enough on this that um, I sometimes say, okay, you know, tell me what it is you don't like. And then someone would say, well, I don't like your company, but you're okay. <laughs> okay, that's fine. What I remind people of is that companies are about balance sheets. They're about profit and loss statements. They don't carry the visions, the hopes, the dreams of, of 
people improving agriculture. The people I work with, we feel passionately. We love agriculture. We really want to make it better. We're the ones who carry the dreams of all these new projects. And if our company makes money, and they should make money, and if that allows us to do more, to improve agriculture even more, hey, that's a good deal. So I have a lot of respect for Monsanto. I've had a great career there. And, and, and it is a, a, a point of pride for me because I'm so proud of the things that we do. Someone doesn't agree with it, that's fine. Um, you know, you can't please everybody. But I have a lot of pride in what it is I've done. I know what I've done. I know what we've done as a company, and I don't have anything to hide about that. Yeah, because it was just quite funny because the reaction even from some of our very loyal viewers when we announced a Monsanto employee, there were some saying, he seems all right, but he's Monsanto, so I'm not going to listen to him, which was, it's kind of, that was, it, it saddened me quite a lot. You know, just, yeah. you know, not, not well, to even just you know, listen. And, and this is a question I have for you guys. I mean, I'm, we're trying to be more open, to be yeah. more transparent. We're getting it. Five, six, ten years ago, if I'd have tried to have this conversation, nobody would want to listen. Yeah. Nobody cared. We've had GMO. We've had BT corn, BT cotton for 20 years. I tried to engage people in conversations. Nothing. With the start of things like the internet, podcasts, all of a sudden everybody's interested. We were slow to respond, but we're here now. What should we do now to engage people to, to get them over that hump of how do we improve agriculture in the future? Um, like education, education, myself. education. <laughs> people yeah. don't understand uh, what, uh, what it is you yeah. do. They hear genetic modification and they uh, they get their information about that from marvel comics so they think uh, you know oh what you're trying to uh, create super villains with the three eyes or whatever and uh, add yeah. to that that it's big business yeah. and i mean let's face it I, I i hate to insult the guest here but you know big companies tend to be assholes it's just that simple they wouldn't <laughs> be big companies otherwise uh, well, so I, uh, I think it's sort of um, Marty, a combination of a lot of things. I have to agree with the perception you talk about. Uh, I'm still explaining X-Files the movie that no, you can't engineer pollen <laughs> to carry a virus <laughs> and infect the entire world with something alien. Uh, I've had people who accept that as fact. Um, and big companies, yeah, there's a lot of suspicion. And you know, are there things that we as a at Monsanto does that, that I wish we were better at? Yeah. Am I proud to work at Monsanto? You bet. Do I see us being different from other big companies? We do some things I am so proud of, so proud that we're involved in. And, and I wish we were better. I wish we were, I'm always trying to be more demanding of our management to do more. But that doesn't degrade the fact that we're pretty darn good where we are yeah. there's a lot of a lot of stuff that goes into it yeah, I, and i'm suspicious of big companies I, i've told a number of people this i still don't know why when i go to the gas station the price of gas is what it is it doesn't seem to have any bearing on the price of crude uh, oh okay there's a there's a refinery in California that's having a problem. Well, I live 2,000 miles away. What does that have to do with me? Yeah. I get it. But um, we're doing pretty good. And agriculture is getting yeah. better every day. Uh, that's one of the most encouraging things I've seen in my career. Yeah. Um, I think I'm about to have a horrible moment where I come off as less of a bastard than Marty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Honestly, well, I would say Marty has it right with the education, education, education. Um, I think it's you could dump spreadsheets for weeks and it won't make much of a dent in the diehard simpletons who just want to hate it for the sake of hating it. I think the best way to do it is by doing stuff like this, by having 
open, honest discussions with people like us who are curious. Yeah, it's easy to hit a big company. It's next to impossible to actually hit every person who works at it. Yeah. It's basically you're a decent person, and I guarantee you that there's at least been one or two minds in the chat that have changed because of the conversations we've been having. So, well, uh, I'll give it, I'll give you a couple of sites that you can go to if you want to know more information. If people would like to co contact me directly, they can get me at Fred Perlack on Twitter. And if they want to know more about Monsanto, they can go to discover.monsanto.com. If they have general questions about GMOs, there's a website called gmoanswers.com that will answer any question they have. Now, you might not like the answer, you might not agree with the answer, but at least you'll get an answer, and it's not just from Monsanto people, staffed by people from universities and, and other companies, organizations that can give you the the kind of balance or a different view from what you might ordinarily see. So those three sites, but you know, contact me. If you guys have a question that somebody has a question that's just really they can't figure out and they want to know what my take would be on it, at Fred Perlack yep. on Twitter. Okay, I'll just go around the team for final question. I see Marty doesn't have one, so Kitch. Um, you, you, just already, a, you just answered my last All right, uh, so Kitch, a uh, quick final question for Fred. Uh, could you come back to me? I'm just, I'm just, uh, just trying to come up with something. All right, uh, Zilla. <laughs> <laughs> Zilla, please answer, um, Zilla. <laughs> there they are. Yeah, I, I just had a couple of questions i've seen about the first one first and and if there is time for the second i'll ask that yeah um firstly obviously in the in the 1990s in europe um especially in the uk we had quite a big um anti-gmo thing going on people going in stomping on like physically stomping on the the product and the crops um i was wondering what's the biggest kind of security concern you faced since you've been working with Monsanto with with your work? Uh, those sorts of things uh, cross my mind, you know, the attack of, of field research. I think in Great Britain you had the added anxiety over mad cow disease where there was a distrust of regulatory agencies and the ability to protect individuals. Had cow disease was such a horrible incident because it seemed to be so random. It seemed to be um, no rhyme or reason for who it hit or how it how it acted or why it did, and it came out of the blue. In terms of my own work, I've never really had issues with security of personal safety. I've had threats, I've had death threats, I've had personal property threats. <laughs> in one of the instances, we talked to the police and the police said, well, don't worry about him, he's crazy. I said, that's the problem, he's crazy. <laughs> uh, but overall, um, I haven't had really too much of an issue. Uh, we've been, we've been, um, fairly well regulated and I think people here understand that. Okay, we're coming up for the last five minutes. Um, there was someone trying to get in, but sadly we just don't have time. So we've got to really start wrapping up. So as always, I'll go around your team for the final thoughts on um, Pumpkin. Um, it's been definitely interesting and fairly enlightening to have the conversation. But uh, one little thing I've wanted to ask is, yeah. I think we can squeeze that. Yeah. Yeah. Considering some of the dumb shit that's been said in the chat, what's the dumbest or most hilarious anti GMO myth you've ever heard? <laughs> um, when I was in Hawaii, someone told me that, uh, that we don't grow coconuts near our uh, corn plants because the corn pollen is genetically engineered and so strong it'll it'll pollinate the coconut plants. I just said, I uh, don't even know how to start to talk about that one. <laughs> um, that's probably the most bizarre one I've heard. Another one I heard was that 
the corn pollen. Uh, it will burn you if it gets on you because it's genetically engineered. <laughs> <laughs> And they said that uh, that's why our workers bundled up so much. And uh, our workers in Hawaii were mainly former sugarcane or pineapple workers, many of them Filipino, other, other groups of individuals. They would bundle up because they didn't want to have their nine, nine hours out in the sun. They didn't want to have to put on sunscreen because, number one, it's expensive. And, number two, you don't want to do it every day. So they bundle up quite a bit. Um, with long sleeve shirts and gloves and and um, put other shirts over their head to protect themselves from the sun. Those people work hard. They're really good people. Um, those were the other ones. Uh, <laughs> one person was saying that our corn pollen was getting on their car and causing rust spots. That was another hilarious one. <laughs> Why next to the ocean? That's... Yep. Yeah, it had nothing to do with that, of course. Um, if you do get some uh, corn pollinated coconuts, can you send them my way so I can have some <laughs> massive pieces of popcorn? Yeah, that, the only problem is when you heat them, they, they, they just blow up. Uh, I live in Northern Ireland. That's a common occurrence. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, uh, Marty, your final thoughts. Yeah, it's uh, it's just been great to have you here. Uh, it's uh, it, it has been really interesting, and uh, I got uh, some questions answered that um, I don't I don't know a lot about this stuff, and so yeah, I thought it was very interesting. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Yeah. I really appreciate it. All right, um, Kitch, your final thoughts, please. Um, it's been uh, it's been very 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 uh, very interesting. And uh, and was yeah, it was just a very interesting discussion. And thanks for taking the time to come on the podcast. Okay. No problem, Kitch. Thanks again. Okay, and Zilla, your final thoughts? Yeah, just thanks for coming on. It does so many questions and so little time as ever with uh, with something like this. But I really appreciate you coming on and answering a few of the questions that I was in the chat room have put to you. That's been great. Okay, um, and uh, as always, we give our guests a little soapbox moment. So, if people have any further questions for you, of the, you know, I know you mentioned it earlier, but just to mention it again for anyone who's not quite got in with a question tonight. Yeah, they can contact me at Fred Perlack on Twitter, uh, or they can get answers on GMOAnswers.com, or if they have specific questions or information they want about Monsanto, it's discover.monsanto.com. Um, please ask. That's the only way we're going to get to the next level is some sort of dialogue. So please ask. Yeah, um, I think I can say for everyone, it's been an uh, absolute pleasure having you on, Fred. It's been fantastic, been very informative. And chat room, if you can do your usual thumbs up for our guest, that'll be fantastic. Yep, the thumbs are going up already. So. <laughs> That's uh, we're like I say, we're back in. Like I say, this show will be uploaded hopefully sometime tomorrow. It'll be instantly up on YouTube. The podcast where I edit out kind of all the gaps and technical glitches should be up. Mm, I do have guests at the moment, so I won't be able to get to editing until late tomorrow. So hopefully Monday evening we should have the audio up. But um, again. Uh, just to let you all know, we're back in two weeks. Our guest then is the BBC journalist John Sweeney. Um, Ziller, you can give us a quick re rundown of John Sweeney. Um, he's basically a, an incredible UK journalist, does a lot of work with the BBC, did um, a few panorama programs, recently went over to North Korea not very long ago, did an expose of the regime there and life under the regime yeah. and he's probably most famous for his work on a, a couple of documentaries on Scientology um, and uncovering the yeah. the kind of underworld of Scientology which made him very famous on YouTube as well <laughs> yeah and yeah I've seen the guy has balls of bell steel yeah and also it's worth mentioning one of his earliest investigations he actually managed to overturn some court rulings in the UK there was four women who were convicted of killing their babies but thanks to his work they managed to overturn it it was diagnosed as caught death so he's 
done some really incredible work and yeah he's one of the greatest investigative journalists yeah right of, of his time yep and so just to let you all know the show will start quite early that day because uh we're starting at 5 p.m we've been given permission to screen some of us um his program so if you tune in at five you'll get to see the programs and then we'll be on with them and you can all it'll be like a question and answer session after seeing his programs but again uh that's what we've got coming forward and again a huge huge thanks to dr perlak it has really been great and they like said i don't i don't think i can add anything more to that but thank you everyone and enjoy your weekend wherever you are please take care till the next time hi cheers bye everyone get drunk and have fun <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, fellas.